Hello, and welcome to the U.S. Chamber Foundation's Path Forward series. If you're just discovering Path Forward, we're delighted to have you with us today. And if you've been joining us regularly throughout the series, welcome back. Today, we're lifting up and exploring the pandemic from a global perspective. As we have been reminded so often over the past year and a half, COVID-19 won't be defeated anywhere until it is defeated everywhere. In the U.S., we are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel, the deadly surges around the world, and the emergence of a new, more transmissible variant of the virus are sobering reminders that the pandemic is far from over. Joining us to discuss where we are in the pandemic, what we've learned from this experience so far, and how we can be better prepared for the next public health emergency is Dr. Mike Ryan. Dr. Ryan is the Executive Director of the World Health Organization's Health Emergencies Program. He has been at the forefront of managing acute risks to global health for nearly 25 years, and he has led many responses to high-impact epidemics. In his current role, Dr. Ryan is part of the WHO headquarters leadership team, working to advance the organization's worldwide mission to promote health, keep the world safe, and serve the vulnerable. What an honorable mission and a great profession, Dr. Ryan. Thank you so much for being with us today. Let me start with the big one. How long do you expect this pandemic to last? Um, thank you, first of all, Suzanne, for uh, the very kind introduction and uh, for the most difficult question any epidemiologist could ever ask. Uh, maybe uh, from a Chamber of Commerce point of view, I could ask you, how long will the next boom, how long will the next bust in economics last? And uh, you'll get as many opinions as there are respondents to a question like that. Um, uh, I, I, I hope it will last as short a time as possible because we've all seen the devastation and the destruction that this uh, little virus, microscopic uh, biologic entity has caused uh, around the world. Uh, I think we could split it into two questions. When when will the death, the tragedy, and the disruption associated with this virus end? That could be a lot sooner than when the virus itself could be ended as a public health threat or ended in, from a point of view of elimination or eradication of the virus. So if we look at what are we, what are we fighting? Are we, are we fighting a virus or are we really trying to mitigate uh, the impacts that the virus has on our society? And that's that impact is is truly mediated through the sickness, the illness, the hospitalizations, the intensive care, the death, and then the consequent social and economic disruption that that has caused. Um, so what are the factors that are that are driving that? Uh, right now, we have um, a, a terribly inequitous global situation, not just in terms of vaccine distribution, but also in terms of health access. So countries are starting not on a level playing field. Um, and even in the countries that have access, there are deep inequities within societies around both uh, delivery of vaccines and delivery of healthcare, uh, and also the demand for that healthcare and the demand uh, for those vaccines. So uh, when will it end? It could end very, very soon if we were able to distribute the countermeasures adequately around the world so we could stop the death and the hospitalizations, get our hospital systems out of trouble, and then by doing that, decrease the level of concern in society that will allow a safe opening up of our society, a return of our economies, a return of travel, when we continue to increase vaccination rates all around the world. Will uh, current vaccination rates stop transmission? No. Um, and will the current generation of uh, vaccines uh, perfectly stop transmission? Probably not. There's encouraging information that the vaccines we have are effective, uh, very highly effective at stopping hospitalization and death. Um, and effective at stopping transmission, but not perfectly so. Uh, so if we continue to leave the conditions where transmission can occur, uh, this first generation of vaccines may not get us to full disease eradication uh, unless we get to extremely high vaccination coverages and continue to match that with surveillance, with testing, with quarantine, with isolation. There are two ways you go after a virus. One is to isolate the virus in a given community and vaccinate uh, within that. And you can, if you use that two punch approach, Tom Frieden talks about that all the time, having the two punches on the virus. It's not going to be by, by vaccination alone. You mentioned target vaccination rates. And what do you think that percentage is? If we get what percentage of the world vaccinated, do we reduce the risk of this contagion? Um, again, 
uh, it's uh, you, you can ask uh, any number of modelers uh, that question you'll get a lot of different answers because of the assumptions on underlying any prediction of that uh, golden number how many people do we need to vaccinate uh, most observers will say that you need to get to 70 to 80 percent vaccination coverage in your total population in order to reduce uh, to significantly impact transmission that may be much higher to get to a point where you could eradicate or eliminate the virus um, and, and nobody knows quite honestly right now uh, if that is possible with the current generation of viruses or the current vaccine coverage that we could attain uh, even the most developed of countries are struggling while their overall vaccination coverage may appear very high, if you look inside a country, there are huge pockets of people that are underprotected. And large pockets of unprotected people can continue to transmit a virus, even if the overall uh, number or coverage in the population is high. If you have large pockets of under-vaccinated people, they can sustain transmission for forever. So it's not just the overall number, it's, it's the distribution of that coverage across the whole population and whether there are significant minorities who remain under vaccinated. Oh my gosh, that too, well, I want to go in seven different directions after that answer. But but let me start. Let me start here. The other news we read a lot about is where did this thing start? Was it an animal? Was it a lab? And I want to take a twist on that question for you, which is why does it matter? Is it important that we figure out where this originated? Um, yeah, thanks, Suzanne. No, it matters because uh, if we, if it, 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 first of all, it's a very difficult thing to do. And for many viruses, historically, we've never fully established the origin. Uh, so, number one, it's a difficult task, but it's one that is worth pursuing because we need to understand that animal, human, that species barrier, and how was that barrier breached? Um, unfortunately, we live in a planet out of balance. We are within a biome, the biologic system that we inhabit. We're just one piece of uh, biologic uh, material in that uh, ecosystem. Uh, and our biome is extremely stressed and dysfunctional. And uh, new viruses are breaching that barrier uh, in a, at a frightening rate over the last 20 years. And that is mediated uh, mainly and primarily by human activity, human behavior, human exploitation of environments, climate-related stress, population migration, animal husbandry that's done at poor levels of biosecurity. There are so many factors that are driving that. Um, and there are huge changes needed in the way we live on this planet and the way we interact and the way we travel and the way we manage those risks. That's the more general setting we live in. But for each and every individual breach, we need to also go back and look for that source because there may be very specific measures we can put in place to prevent that source uh, happening again. And we've seen this with uh, SARS-like viruses. We've seen with SARS-1 um, in, in 2003. We've seen with the, the emergence of the Middle East respiratory virus, MERS. Uh, these are all coronaviruses, and now we have a pandemic caused. So this, this family of viruses has had a few goals at starting a pandemic. First with, as I say, SARS, then MERS, and now a successful assault in terms of creating a, a global pandemic. But there are literally millions of those viruses out there in nature, uh, and very often in small mammals like, like bats. And these viruses live in inhabit and probably have reached a, 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 a sort of homeostasis. They, they, they live in, this, in these animals and not usually causing any disease. Uh, and certain factors then can cause that disease to transfer from those animals through to humans or through an intermediate host, through a, a different animal in between us and those bats um, that processes the virus and allows it to become fitter, allows it to adapt to another mammal. And then ultimately that adaptation can cause a human to be infected. And then the virus further adapts as we've seen with the emergence of the variants. The variants that have emerged are an adaptation process. The virus continues to evolve and adapt and try and become fitter. This is a natural biologic process, uh, and it is a great lottery biologically as to when and where that uh, species barrier is breached. And we need to look for that. There are both, uh, and that can occur in any uh, number of scenarios, from people going into caves for tourism, to uh, animal husbandry uh, in, in farming wild animals and the illegal trade in wild animals. There are so many scenarios 
in which that disease can breach the species barrier. And we need to be alert to that. Uh, we need to reduce the overall risk of that happening. And we need to investigate each and every time we have a species breach, we need to find out how did that occur, when did that occur, so we can put in place the necessary measures to prevent that occurring again. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Uh, one of the goals of this program has been to get as good and solid professional science and information out there as we can. And we have a question now coming from an audience member in New Jersey. Hi, I'm Melissa Boardman from Atria Consulting in New Jersey. My question is, do the current mRNA vaccinations protect us at the 90 to 95% efficacy range from all of the current COVID strains? And when will we need boosters to maintain these current immunity levels? Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you. No, that is an excellent question. And I actually, in the last call I was on with our UN colleagues, we were discussing this because it's a very, very important uh, issue. Um, and you spoke specifically to the mRNA vaccines. Uh, what we can say is that all the data we have so far demonstrates that these vaccines remain highly effective against um, all strains, all variants of, of the virus that we currently know about and are still highly protective against severe illness, against hospitalization and against death. So do these vaccines do what they say on the tin? Absolutely. The, and all of the vaccines we have seem to have that high level of protection, particularly the mRNAs. So I can assure you that those vaccines remain highly effective against all of the uh, all of the variants for those outcomes, like severe disease. Where it's not so certain is to what extent do, do the current, uh, uh, we've got 17 vaccines out there at the moment all around the world, to what extent do they protect against becoming infected? Or if you become infected and not feel very well, your chances of passing that disease on to someone else. And it is clear from the, the emerging data that uh, the, the, as the variants have emerged, uh, there, the vaccines aren't quite as effective at, uh, at decreasing your risk of just being infected or potentially passing that on to someone else. So these vaccines are still hugely effective in the life-saving job they have to do, uh, but we have to continue monitoring uh, how effective they are at preventing infection or preventing transmission of disease. And that's why we constantly say it's not vaccines alone. We have to continue doing some of the measures to reduce our own personal risk in order to make sure that we're not infected. And that creates uh, uh, a lot of uh, concern for people because people make a, a, an honest assumption. Well, if I'm vaccinated, I'm protected. Uh, and the answer is yes, you are protected. You're protected against becoming severely ill. You're protected against being hospitalized. You're protected against dying very significantly. But it doesn't mean, especially with the new variants, that you are protected from having uh, an infection itself. And I think one of the things we hear a lot is from parents of children too young to be vaccinated. That they're afraid vaccinated people can still transmit the virus to their children. And the science seems to be a little bit unclear about that, um, but perhaps, perhaps not. Maybe you're bringing us news, which is that the science mm -hmm. seems to be saying that you can, you can transmit this virus even if you're vaccinated. Yeah, for, for most people who get the vaccine, the evidence would suggest that it, it does prevent infection and transmission. It's just not as effective uh, at doing that as it is at preventing severe illness and death. So it's it, when we say the word effective, uh, no vaccine uh, is 100% effective. There will always be a small proportion of people who don't react to the vaccine or don't generate immunity from a vaccine, tiny percentage in this case, and these vaccines are remarkable in how effective they are. Um, but uh, when you speak about uh, children, I mean, the, the vaccines increasingly are being shown to be safe and effective in children. And that's very important to have that data. How and when and where they should be used in children as part of the overall strategy is a policy question, not a science question. Uh, and that is something that many countries are facing now. How do we use these vaccines in our, ch uh, in our childhood population? And is that the best use of the vaccine given the global context? And the global context is there are still millions and millions of people around the world, health workers and highly vulnerable uh, older people, people with underlying conditions who have no vaccine. Uh, and they're at a very high risk of becoming severely ill and a very high risk of dying, especially in the context of variants that are emerging. And they have no protection. 
So the issue here is, would we want to protect everyone? Absolutely. Our goal should always be to protect as many people as possible. But you should also look at who needs to be protected first. In the United States, when you started vaccinating in the United States, you didn't start vaccinating everyone first. You first started vaccinating the older population, health workers, and the most vulnerable. That was the right move. That was the right strategy, to start with those most likely to suffer the consequences of this disease. From our perspective in WHO, we're saying that's the strategy we need globally too. We need to vaccinate the most vulnerable, our older uh, populations, those with underlying conditions, and our frontline health workers. It's exactly the same strategy, the one that's working in the United States. The question is, now that we have uh, hundreds of millions of vaccines available, billions of vaccines available around the world, how should we use them? And at the moment, uh, in the last, if we just take the last week, there was a 40% increase in cases in Africa. The tra trajectory in Africa is very worrying. Africa has the weakest health systems uh, uh, in the world, and Africa has um, the fastest rising rate of, uh, of COVID-19 in the world. But it has the lowest rates of vaccination in the world because countries in Africa simply do not have access to the vaccine. Is that fair? Is that fair that the countries who are most at risk uh, are now not having access to vaccine while we consider uh, how we vaccinate the whole population uh, in the Northern Hemisphere? So you, please try and put yourself in the, in the place of someone living in a developing country right now. You know, it's interesting. We've had other speakers on this program um, talk about, I mean, you, you were particularly eloquent about the humanitarian crisis and what our obligation is to those populations. We've had other speakers also talk about the danger of letting the virus run amok in these populations because that's how it mutates, that's how it, and so you know, do you imagine that, that there are even more dangerous mutations coming? If, you know, what, what do you, I guess I'm asking beyond the, um, depths of the humanitarian crisis that you just described. Mm -hmm. What, as a doctor, as a scientist, what do you think about the mutation possibilities, the variant possibilities? I mean, one one angle would be, do the variants actually, does it start to weaken in some way? Could it make a mistake mm -hmm. as a virus? Or do you see it just in these uncontrolled populations getting to a point where it could learn to get around a vaccine or learn to kill a child? Uh, Again, a very good question, and 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 the virus itself, uh, uh, Susan, uh, as we know, doesn't have a brain, so it has no motive uh, in 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 any of this, and no no sense of direction or no sense of objective. All the virus is is, uh, is in effect, it's a uh, viruses are a, what they call they 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 must be in a human to survive. Viruses can survive outside uh, a, another biologic system. They depend for the very existence. They don't live in the free environment. They can survive in the free environment for a few hours on surfaces, but they need a host in order to reproduce. And in reproducing, they reproduce themselves billions and billions of times over. So the more opportunities we give a virus to infect a human, the more opportunities that virus has to evolve. Um, the uh, The way the virus evolves is it has, it as it, sort of sends the instructions into the human cells, it makes errors, it makes small little errors in the coding. It's like making a coding error in, in writing a, a computer program. The vast majority of those errors result in no advantage to the virus or a disadvantage. Uh, but if, they, if the virus has those millions and millions of opportunities to reproduce, just by chance, it hits on a formula, a combination of mutations, a combination of, of, of a genetic sequence, that gives it an advantage. And that usual advantage that really works for the virus is an advantage in transmission, an advantage over other viruses that allows it to be more successful at infecting others. And that's what we've seen with the various uh, variants that have emerged, the alpha, the beta, the delta variant. They've replaced, to a great extent, the previous variant. And the reason they're doing that is they're fitter and more successful in transmitting. It doesn't mean they get more lethal, and very often we see with diseases that emerge, they can become actually milder uh, as they adapt to humans and they can become more transmissible and mild, but they can also become more transmissible and more deadly at the same time. And that's just a matter of chance. The more we leave the virus in a community to transmit, the more chance it has of achieving 
that sort of fitter uh, and potentially a more deadly um, 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 capacity. So leaving the virus to transmit uncontrollably is not a good idea. Uh, and, and these viruses have that capacity just to continue to evolve. And it's an evolutionary process of the virus. The virus is in the race of its life to survive, and we're in the race of our lives to suppress that transmission. And vaccines are one of the most effective ways to put a barrier between us and the virus. Uh, uh, the, the virus breached the species barrier between humans. What vaccines do is break the cycle of transmission between humans. We're choosing to break the cycle of transmission. We've had to do that with public health and social measures by separating people from each other. Uh, that's not sustainable in the long term. We've seen the impacts that has socially and on our economies. It's been highly effective where it's been done properly in conjunction with surveillance, but it's not a long-term solution. Vaccination is a long-term solution. And I hope that the second and third generations of vaccines that do come along will be highly effective at stopping transmission. And if they are, we have a chance to eradicate this virus. Right now, we need to stop the pressure on the health systems. We need to stop the deaths. And we need to get our economies and other, other things moving. The vaccines we have at our disposal and the measures we know on the knowledge we have is perfectly adequate to do that. We can do that. The problem is those capacities and those countermeasures are not distributed evenly in the world. And we're going to leave huge portions of this planet unprotected where the virus will continue to transmit. And God forbid, we'll end up in a situation in a year's time where more fit, more adapted viruses that may escape vaccine efficacy will come back uh, and then reinfect the very countries that have been so successful uh, in doing vaccination. So, you know, we saw this shocking surge in India and uh, the U.S. business community became very involved in seeing what we could do to get supplies there to help uh, the hospital overloads, the oxygen problems, the ventilator problems, et cetera. Um, and so moving beyond the vaccinations for a second, as you think about, you mentioned Africa a minute ago, I just brought up India. What should countries be doing to make sure they're prepared to handle these caseloads in the meantime? I mean, is it, uh, do we have a global shortage of oxygen? Are there more things countries should be doing that the business community could be helping with? Yes, I mean, this is an area where the private sector has a huge, and has, has contributed greatly. Um, and uh, leaving aside our need to suppress transmission and, and reduce the number of patients coming through the system through vaccination or through public measures, you're right. There have and have been and are and will continue to be situations where we get a high number of people requiring clinical care. And they usually come in a surge as part of a surge in infections. Keeping the surges to a minimum will reduce the pressure on the system. But that pressure has happened, as you said, in, in countries like India, Nepal, Brazil, and many other places, in, in everywhere. Look at Europe and North America last year. It's not like all of a sudden the systems in the, the south have failed. The systems in the north failed uh, as well. All systems will fail, and complex systems fail in a very complex way, and they're very hard to fix. Uh, you know that from a business perspective. Uh, in business, the more complex your system is, when it breaks, uh, the harder it is to fix it. We, we all know that 30, 40 years ago, we could all lift the hood on our car and probably fix ourselves at the side of the road. Now you need a degree in computer science to even understand what's wrong with your car. So complex systems fail in complex way and they're hard to fix. Uh, so um, uh, the advantage that many developing countries have is their systems are, 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 are simpler and more direct, but the problem is they're undergeared, they're underprovided. They don't have the materials, they don't have the trained health workers, and it's very hard for them to surge effectively. Uh, so um, when you're going to have people getting sick, the most important thing in COVID is a very small proportion of people, a relatively small proportion of people with COVID get that severe syndrome of requiring oxygen, requiring hospitalization. It's making sure that those individuals are picked up early and pushed into the system properly so they can get the care they need, get the oxygen, get the dexamethasone and corticosteroids, get the expert clinical care. Because it's that supportive care mixed with oxygen, corticosteroids, and now increasingly some of the immunotherapies and other uh, drugs that are hopefully coming down the pipe. But that's not a, an issue of drugs or commodities. That's an issue of how a system is operated, how it works, who gets access. Uh, how is that access managed? What are the clinical triage pathways? 
uh, like any system, again, from a private sector point of view, this is a, a hospital or a clinical care system is like a production line that starts at the community and ends with someone being discharged healthy from a hospital. There are a tremendous number of processes and decisions that occur between that person feeling slightly ill on, on a given day and then ultimately getting very sick, being admitted to hospital and then hopefully been discharged from hospital uh, on, a, on a path to recovery. That is a complex chain and the private sector is very important in that chain. Um, in many countries in the world, uh, healthcare delivery is delivered by uh, private systems, commodities, drugs, oxygen, ventilators, uh, oxygen concentrators, at the technicians who fix these machines and service these machines and, and other things. They're all coming from the private sector. So the private sector is a hugely important partner in being able to deliver comprehensive medical services end to end. But the system has got to work. And that's the problem in many developing countries. The systems just aren't strong enough and they need to be shored up now. And if we look at Africa, uh, we need to shore those systems up now. And we're desperately trying to do that um, with our public and private sector partners. And we really do welcome private sector engagement and how to solve these problems. Uh, and there have been many innovations around how we can do that. But ultimately, if I am someone on day six or seven of my disease and I'm sick and I'm in hospital, uh, there's a, a there's a chance that I may develop that desaturation where my oxygen falls. I've got swelling in my lungs. At that point, I need to be in a hospital that has oxygen, that has corticosteroids, that has a trained health worker that can put me on a ventilator if I need it to support me through those really dark days of the infection. And those of you out there who've suffered severe disease will know what I'm saying. And it's that moment in time. Can we connect the services and the commodities that are needed? in that moment where that human being needs that intervention. Connecting a trained worker with the right tools and the right drugs and the right uh, um, system uh, to be able to do that. And we can save, and countless lives have been saved around the world by really brave, uh, exhausted health workers. But they've done that with equipment and supplies and training and technical support from the private sector as well. So you make an important point about the importance of kind of mobilizing early and getting the right supplies in the right place. One of the questions we get a lot is from the private sector is we're not sure which place will surge next and therefore which places we should be helping most. So what are the leading indicators that you rely on at the WHO to help monitor the spread of the virus and where the surges might take place next? Um, yes, we could be here all night, Suzanne. This is a very uh, interesting topic. Uh, and again, in the private sector, you're always looking for what are the minimum number of indicators we need to manage a given business process. And uh, um, we look at these key performance indicators or key epidemiologic indicators. Um, uh, and you're correct. The point of impact of the pandemic is, is shifting. And it's shifting because of epidemiologic factors. It's shifting because of... Uh, factors related to the lifting of public health and social measures it's shifting because of the emergence of variants uh, it's shifting because of the availability or lack of availability of vaccines so there's a number of underlying parameters that drive the chances that a given country will enter into that concerning situation where there's a surging of infections um, a surging of severe disease and then poor outcomes because of an undergeared health system. And they're the three things that drive it. If I have an increasing uh, number of cases, but I have very high levels of uh, vaccination protection, then I'm going to have you know, quite a lot of people with a mild disease, but it's not going to drive death. It's not going to drive hospitalizations. If I have a surge in infections, but I don't have good vaccine protection, then inevitably it is going to drive um, the hospital system. So when we look at the, the factors that are going to drive the situation, it's going to be around the attack rate uh, in your populations, the, per, you know, the number of cases per head of population. It's going to be tracking hospitalizations or uh, um, um, primary care referrals and hospitalizations and deaths. They're, they're lagging indicators. By the time you get to measuring hospitalizations and measuring deaths, uh, you're way behind the curve. Uh, so you need to really look at the the direction of travel uh, in terms of the intensity of transmission. You need to be looking at the variants that are causing that transmission and what, uh, what variants are driving that. 
uh, you need to be looking at the performance and capacity parameters of your health system and project forward and say, okay, of a projected X number of cases in three, four weeks' time, how many of them do we believe will be severe given our vaccination rates, given our underlying population vulnerabilities? There's a number there. And we've done that. We've been modeling that here at WHO, even from a supply point of view. We, have, uh, we estimate the supplies that countries will need based on projecting parameters regarding the number of hospitalizations and deaths that we can expect uh, over the, the coming weeks. Um, and we'd be very happy, uh, I'm sitting here with uh, a colleague, Mike Griffin, who's been working very closely with the private sector around how we can do joint monitoring and joint modeling of these needs uh, uh, going forward. But you can get to a number. Uh, and, and that number isn't the number that will actually happen. What you hope is you'll avoid the, the negative outcomes by doing good planning. Um, um, I think uh, Eisenhower once said, uh, uh, a battle plan never survives first contact with the enemy. And I think it's true. Uh, um, um, uh, I think the same great general said that he, he found plans useless, but he found planning essential. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's where we need to be. We need to be projecting forward the demand in the healthcare system and then shoring up the system to deal with that demand. But it's not just commodities, it's beds, it's isolation facilities, it's being able to treat the worried well or the mildly ill outside the system to preserve the space for those severely ill inside the system and that triage approach. So it's not just the commodities, it's how the system will work. Uh, and we do, as I say, have very specific, uh, uh, indicators that we use and we'd be very happy to interact with colleagues in the private sector on how we make that better uh, and be more relevant uh, in providing information to the private sector around how we project numbers at a global level. Well, I really appreciate that, uh, Dr. Ryan, and to, to the other Mike, your colleague. Now I think that everybody there is named Mike, by the way, because I have a They were all Mike's. Yes. We all changed our name to Mike. It's, it makes it easier, right? Yeah. Um, but to you, Dr. Ryan, and to your colleague, Mike, you know, you certainly have my commitment and, and, and all of us at the U.S. Chamber are standing ready to help in any way, and sh whether that's sharing information, sharing plans, understanding the hot spots. I think we learned a lot in the India situation and figuring out what was needed, the best ways to get it there. Um, and so I hope that this will be uh, an important collaboration and a good partnership. And you can count on the business community to want to do the right thing and to be, uh, to be helpful doing it. These complex systems, um, you're right, can fail in really complex ways, but they can also succeed in more simple ways if we at least yes. share information and, and Absolutely. do the right thing. So I hope you'll count yeah. on us as a partner. And I think this next audience question from Florida gets right to that point. Hello, Dr. Hello, Ryan. Dr. Thank you for Thank spending you some for time, spending with, us some time with us today. Uh, in the business community, we appreciate very much uh, your expertise and, and efforts in this uh, critical topic for the global um, environment and, and everybody that um, is trying to deal with this. I have one question that I think may be on the mind of a number of us in the business community who may not be um, corporate players in the pharmaceutical sector. And that is from a strategic standpoint, what is the single most important step that the organized business community um, can take at this time to assist uh, in the effort to quell the pandemic going forward. And I look forward to your reply. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, that, that's a, that's, a, that's a, a really, um, really good question. Um, and there are so many areas. Um, uh, and I think, Again, let, maybe let's uh, take it through the kind of the cycle of things that we do. We need the private sector to continue research and innovation, bringing new products to bear, be it uh, better vaccines, uh, better diagnostics, uh, adapting equipment uh, so that it can be simplified and, and used uh, in, in clinical settings and in, in less resource settings. So there's a tremendous amount that the private sector can do in the research and the innovation side. Um, there's also um, uh, a tremendous amount the private sector could do, quite frankly, in funding public sector initiatives or partnering with the public sector initiatives around global surveillance uh, um, a, in terms of uh, uh, building better systems. Uh, all of what we do should be a public-private uh, partnership uh, in future. 
Uh, we're, 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 we co-deliver healthcare all of, around the world, public and private sector partners and, and non-governmental or civil society partners. Uh, healthcare is no longer the purview of a state-based system. Um, it requires a partnership of civil society, of the public system and of the private system. So there's work we need to do in strengthening healthcare systems together, making them more reliable, making them more responsive, and also convincing government that healthcare, which is increasingly seen as a center of cost in society, it's a cost. It's not seen as a strategic investment. It's not seen like national defense. Uh, we're not in investing in over-engineering our health system to be capable of dealing with the shock. We over-engineer our buildings all the time. We're doing that. Anyone of you who live in California or another earthquake-prone parts of the United States know how much extra is put in to designing and building a building in an earthquake zone. It is written in. It's not seen as a cost. It's seen as an investment against future failure of that building in a predictable earthquake scenario. We are not doing that in the healthcare system. And we're paying a huge price globally for not having done that. And that's not just a concern of the public sector. Nobody wants the health systems to fail. It's in nobody's interest. Nobody wants our surveillance systems to fail. It's in nobody's interest. Look at the health, social, and economic chaos this has caused. And a great deal of that chaos has come from weak public health systems not being able to function in surveillance and containment, weak health systems not being able to cope with the 100 year or the 10 year or 100 year storm, whatever way you want to call it, or the earthquake. And our systems are simply not being engineered or funded to do that. And it requires those of us who work in the public sector and those of you in the private sector to convince policymakers that engineering our systems to be capable of taking the hit of, of pandemic disease is, is, is seen as a national and global defense against uh, against these uh, events. Um, I would say very practically speaking when it comes to supplies, because I think the private sector has done a very good job on the innovation side and helped very much. We wouldn't have these vaccines without private sector innovation. We wouldn't have many of the tests we have rolling out. We wouldn't have a lot of the solutions we have without private sector leadership. But I think one area where things got very, very confused, and I must say, uh, uh, a barroom brawl is probably an underestimate of what happened last year in terms of commodity supplies and supply chains. There was every negative activity you could think of in terms of the supply of life-saving uh, protective gear uh, in terms of ventilators and everything else. Uh, it became an each man, each woman, each company from themselves. Um, we have had wonderful interaction with a group called the Pandemic Supply Chain Network. We've had many private sector uh, companies involved with us uh, on that over years where we've been trying to define commodity profiles for what are these core commodities that are needed in situations like this and how can we protect supply chains. The problem last year was the supply chains broke down at every level. They broke down in terms of raw materials and products. We realized we we're completely dependent on a small number of companies who produce for, produce, for example, surgical gloves. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it broke down in terms of uh, procurement and distribution and delivery and pricing and logistics and just you know, everything, uh, demand management and all of that. And what happened in the course of that is we got price gouging, we got uh, contracts not been honored, we got substandard material in the global system we had huge problems. Uh, now, we managed collectively to fix many of them through the supply chain system, and we created an architecture in which this could be managed more effectively. But if I was to ask the private sector, beyond your work on vaccines, beyond the work in the health system, if there was one area where we could work together for the next pandemic, and even for the rest of this one, is to really streamline how we manage supply chains so we can get the right stuff to the right people in the right time to save lives because last year that was not the case that was simply not the case and we all have to improve in that regard a little bit of a, a, a subject change here but i know we only have a few more minutes and i have a couple more topics i'd love to cover one is 
uh, kind of the renewed interest in the development of kind of antiviral pills, something that could be prescribed once you have symptoms or you're diagnosed. When do you imagine we see a kind of Tamiflu for COVID-19? Um, the, uh, yeah, I'll use the Ossel Tamivir name, so I won't use the, the trade name. You're right. Uh, when we look at uh, responding to an emerging disease uh, or a, a, a potential pandemic, you have a number of options, Suzanne, when you start. You can try and contain the disease with public health measures, and then you say, well, let's, let's build a vaccine. But uh, building a vaccine, as we've seen, even with massive investment, you know, can take six months to a year. It's incredible what's been achieved with this, these vaccines, but it's still months. Um, and we've seen uh, how people preventing someone with a mild disease, progressing to severe disease, uh, is one of the first ways in which you can reduce the impact of an impending pandemic. Because if, number one, it can save the lives immediately. And number two, it should impact the infectiousness of that individual. Because if you cure them quickly or reduce the viral load, they're less likely to infect others. So having broad spectrum antivirals available for that initial phase of responding to a pandemic is absolutely vital. And we have not invested enough in those antivirals uh, or in good immune modulators, things that, because a lot of the severe illness in in COVID, as well as in Ebola and other emerging diseases, not mediated directly by the virus. It's mediated by our immune response to that presence of that virus. So on two sides, one, direct antivirals and better immune modulators, and having those available and in bulk and broad spectrum antivirals that work against many viruses would be superb. There's a tremendous amount of investment going on into small molecule research by many, many small biotech companies around the world. I know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are funding a good deal of that on the US side. I know the NIH uh, and are, 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 are doing a lot of that in, in, in the US uh, as well. And that's really important for now because we need to continue to try and develop those uh, antivirals that could be given early. It would be a game changer in this pandemic if we had that, but it would certainly be a game changer for the next pandemic in terms of the trajectory of such a pandemic. So I couldn't agree more. We need a lot more investment. It's not easy. Um, you know, if it were easy, uh, we'd have done it already. Uh, it's the same thing with universal vaccines. These aren't easy technological challenges. Um, and it does need, I believe, philanthropic and state investment to incentivize this kind of research because it's high risk research. Companies can spend a tremendous amount of money developing products that ultimately, in inverted commas, don't work. But unless we try all of them and invest in even the processes that don't work, we won't find the one that does work. Uh, and if we purely take a, a competitive approach to this, where it's uh, uh, first past the post is the winner, then that's not going to incentivize the broad base of research we need in academia and in the, uh, the, private, sec uh, the private sector to drive this. So I do think we need a kind of a Marshall plan that incentivizes the private sector to continue working in this space because it's a high risk space for the private sector to work in. And that risk needs to be shared and absorbed across society in order for that work to continue. So if I had a wish, you know, as the Santa wish, <laughs> you know, what would I want in my stocking at Christmas? I would love to think that we were really investing more in broad spectrum antivirals, as well as vaccine technology. The mRNA technology, the vector-based virus uh, platforms, are transformational in vaccination for the future in general. We've probably made more progress in one year in vaccine technology in two years than we've made in the previous 10 or 20 years. Uh, we need to make similar progress on the therapeutic side. We absolutely, especially early therapeutics, we'd like to have therapeutics that work through the course of the disease, but you are correct. If we had a therapeutic, an antiviral that worked early in the disease, it could be a game changer. But again, remember, drugs like Oseltamivir don't prevent uh, the disease uh, progression per se. They reduce the severity of symptoms and they reduce the period of infectiousness and they reduce the time that the person might spend in hospital. So they are helpful and effective, but they're not silver bullets. They're not golden bullets either. Well, um, listen, I have a really direct line to Santa, so I'll see what I can do <laughs> about, your, about your wish there. Uh, but in the meantime, we're gonna go to our last audience question, this one from the great state of Virginia. Hello. Hello, my name is Jennifer Strachbein and I work for Norfolk Grumman in Virginia. My question is, what should we as companies do to prepare for the fall? 
Um, thanks very much for the question. I, I think that very much depends on where you are. Uh, because I think it maybe depends on where you are within the United States and where you are on this planet. Because the prospects for the fall are very different depending on where you are. Um, uh, I think to be realistic, uh, I think it's important for me to say that this this pandemic is not over. It's not nearly over. And I think we need, for private companies out there, I think there needs to be that internalization. Uh, because the appearance of normality is returning in many uh, northern economies, uh, many uh, high income settings. And I, I don't want to be using the Christmas uh, theme again. I don't want to be the Grinch here. <laughs> I want more than anything for this to be over. I, I've seen my kids three times in a year uh, because of the restrictions of, of travel, because they don't live in the same country as, 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 as I do here in Switzerland. So as a personal level, I want this uh, to be over. And as a serving public health profession for 30 years, having gone through Ebola, gone through SARS, gone through H1N1 pandemic, I've seen so many diseases like cholera and others. I've seen the devastating impact of these diseases firsthand up front. I've worked in the front line in Ebola wards. I've seen what an emerging disease does to a human being. I want this to be over, but it's not over. We have not found the solutions that will stop the death and stop the hospitalizations and the severity of this. We have the means to do that now, and we're not choosing to do it. But collectively, we haven't found a complete solution for ending the pandemic in terms of infections. I believe we will, but our first task is to end this pandemic as a human tragedy. And that is in our grasp right now. We can bring our economies back online. We can take the pressure off our health care systems if we distribute the commodities that are available equitably around the world. We need to continue to do surveillance. We need to continue to do testing and expand testing. I know it sounds, uh, and we need to continue to isolate ourselves. If we're sick, uh, we can't just rely on the vaccines to do everything. What we try and do is do good public health uh, uh, surveillance. We need, sick people still need to be isolated. Contacts of sick people still need to self quarantine. Um, and then we need to get vaccination levels up to the highest possible levels. Uh, while shoring up our healthcare systems. And that needs to happen everywhere. I am sure there are parts of the United States in which you've got low vaccine coverage and you still have residual weakness in the health system from all of the effort health workers put in for the last year. There isn't a country or a setting in which everything is the same uh, across. So I think the private sector uh, needs to prepare itself for continued uh, disruption. Uh, I hope that disruption is minimal. But the private sector also needs to gear itself up for being um, the innovators uh, and helping us drive these solutions. Uh, it is in the interest right now of us all on this planet to uh, distribute vaccines in a way that we can save lives. Because right now, uh, there are countries entering into another wave of this disease and they simply are not protected. Uh, and most of your companies, I presume, that you have online are globally distributed. So you're not sitting in one country. So if we want to have a return uh, to multinational commerce and multinational engagement, then we're going to have to have a multinational solution to this pandemic. And we simply do not have that yet. I'm gonna ask you a question that's gonna sound like I wasn't listening. So I heard you just say that this pandemic is not over and yet I still wanna take us to a place in the future where it is for a minute. Um, I read a 2019 report that the WHO did with the World Bank and in talking about kind of disease X and what could come next. And I want to read you this quote. For too long, we have allowed a cycle of panic and neglect when it comes to pandemics. We ramp up efforts when there is a serious threat, then quickly forget about them when the threat subsides. So taking ourselves forward to a point where we have eradicated COVID-19, mm -hmm. what should we be doing to ensure that we don't forget this, it doesn't fade from our memory, and that we're preparing for the next threat. Um, that's really is, the, the, if you, uh, again, Chambers of Commerce and people working in industry and the private sector, I think, you know, stability is something everybody wants. That's why the IMF was set up. That's why we have mechanisms. That's why we have central banks. That's why we have regulation of stock markets, right? Because we want to have progress 
and we want to have uh, prosperity, but we don't want instability. Uh, and I think that's the same when it comes to uh, to uh, epidemics. Uh, you and the private sector, we know boom and bust cycles, you know, and we know it. We know we had the bug, we had the big collapse in 2008. And we know at some point in the future, there's, there's potentially another one coming. What are we doing to mitigate the chance that that will occur? And what are we doing to respond when that does inevitably occur? And I will put it to you, we're probably doing very little because we forget. We're programmed to forget as human beings. We're programmed to move on to the next survival challenge, uh, which isn't what happened yesterday, it's what's happening today. Uh, and that is the danger, lest we forget what's just happened. Uh, and I think that happens. It's an inevitable um, uh, occurrence. But we simply cannot forget this time. Uh, I've, I've been around doing this for a long time. I, my first Ebola response, I think, in 1995. Uh, and each time we've said, you know, you know, the world will wake up now. Surely everyone will get it. This is important after um, SARS, after H5N1 after the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, after the Ebola outbreak of West Africa in 2014, after the Ebola outbreaks of the last few years in, D in, in, in DR Congo, after Zika virus, after, after, after. Um, and we simply have not, we have forgotten. Uh, and I think that quote comes originally from a good friend of mine, Jim Kim, uh, who's, who, who I think coined that phrase of cycle of panic and neglect and never was a truer word said. But it doesn't, that's our past, and the cycle of panic and neglect is real. That doesn't have to be our future. Um, and right now, this is, this is existential, because the trajectory of emerging diseases is they're becoming more frequent, they're becoming more severe, and they're becoming more disruptive. Do we think that's going to stop now? Absolutely not, because the conditions driving those emerging diseases and pandemic threats are increasing, not decreasing. And our vulnerabilities to those threats are increasing, not decreasing. Our connectedness globally is what's driving the transmission of disease all around the world. We need to turn that connectedness. The fact that we are connected globally, the fact that we can build vaccines in months, the fact that we can share data in seconds, the fact that we can sequence viruses anywhere in the world and share that information, the fact that we can build solutions, the fact that we have supply chains that can get stuff from A to B in hours. We have tremendous capacities of connectedness. Uh, and we need to start leveraging those for the future. And it requires an investment that's not seen as a cost. It requires us recognizing. And I often say it to friends of mine, you know, when you have a car, you pay for car insurance or you pay for house insurance, you don't go back to the company at the end of the year and say, please give me my money back. I didn't crash my car. Please give me my money back. Uh, my house didn't burn down. You don't. You still consider that a good investment because you're hedging against the chance that it might occur. And you invest your money in that, in mitigating the impact that will have on you. We're not doing that in health. We're not doing that for emerging diseases. And we need a multi-sectoral, multi-year, generational investment, not a one-cycle investment of two or three years between elections, wherever they may be. We need a generational commitment to fixing a planet that's out of balance, a biome that's out of balance, a human society that is exploiting our environment faster than our capacity to manage the risks that that's creating. And if you accept uh, as a, a, a group that, that uh, promotes commerce and, and as a chambers of commerce, if we accept that globalization and, 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 and that approach is bringing benefits to the world, if you accept that as, uh, as true, you also have to accept that that very same process brings with it risks. There is no innovation. There is no thing in the world that brings benefit that doesn't bring risk. And the real question is, if we accept the benefits of that, we must then measure and manage the risks. We are simply not doing that. We are driving a global economy. We are driving a global financial model that is not identifying and specifically investigating and identifying, reducing, and managing the risks that that occurs. We do this all the time with environmental planning. When we go to build a factory, we do environmental impact studies, and we invest in reducing the impact of that industry on the environment. It's built into the system. For epidemics, nothing is built into the system. And we have to look at that and make you know, predictable, sustainable financing in order to reduce the risk of epidemics, 
to manage and contain those epidemics that occur and to mitigate the impacts on our society and our economies. And that requires long-term sustained investment, not donations and not philanthropy and, and not charity. That is not the way to manage an existential risk to our civilization. As you think about your own organization there at the WHO, what does it need to do to prepare, to invest, to coordinate? You know, what, 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 what is ultimately the modern WHO role in what you just discussed? Um, uh, well, I think we have a, a very strong role and maybe we can explain that we are WHO is a secretariat here in Geneva. We have nine, six regional offices. We've got 157 operations in, in 100, or operations in 157 countries uh, around the world. But we're not, that's not WHO. The World Health Organization is 194 member states who came together uh, 70 years ago and agreed a constitution to co-manage risks to health, be they long-term risks like uh, infectious diseases or hypertension or diabetes or cancer, and these urgent risks like epidemics. Uh, and therefore, what WHO does is effectively emanates from the will of those member states. Uh, I will put it to you that uh, the, the whole of WHO, I think, operates on uh, less than the budget of uh, a medium-sized hospital group in the United States. It's a very, very small organization in terms of the challenges we face. Uh, we have work to do in the normative space and the technical space and the operational space. We cover all diseases. We cover all countries. It's a tremendous challenge. It's a huge honor. And we are all very proud to work for this organization. Uh, and we're very, very proud to serve all of our member states, including all of you in the United States and, and around the world. Uh, but it is a gargantuan task. And none of what we do happens without those partners around the world, those uh, collaborating centers, scientific collaborators, academic, public, and private. We are really, um, in a sense, WHO is a convener, a collaborator, a coordinator. Uh, we are there to be that spider in the web, but, but we are not. Uh, the, the sum total of what we do is through our partnerships, through our collaborations, uh, and, and through the, the, the good offices and innovation and brilliance of so many scientists in the public and private sector, so many health workers around the world. We need sustainable financing in WHO. We need to evolve as an organization and we need to learn from this pandemic uh, because uh, this organization, like all health organizations around the world, I think is underinvested in this risk management for, for epidemics and pandemics. And we currently uh, have a, an ongoing uh, consultation with our member states on, on sustainable financing for WHO and all of its activities. So we do face uh, transformational challenges. The Director General, Dr. Tedros, was elected on a, a manifesto of that. We've had a transformation uh, process in place for the last three or four years. We are changing our structures. We're changing our orientation. We are being trying to be more relevant to the needs of our member states. We are uh, uh, constantly trying to learn how to do better as an organization. But as an organization, again, just to remind you, we, we are no more than the will and financing and support of those member states, of those collaborating centers and scientific, public and private institutions who work with us 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, we're, as I said, we're extremely proud to serve. We're particularly proud to serve those who have leased uh, and we'll continue to do so. But as I say, we're, we're just one piece in this big global puzzle. Well, Dr. Ryan, um, we really appreciate you sharing your wisdom with us today. We appreciate the service of you and all the mics at the WHO in what you're doing for uh, the world at this time. We look forward to following up with you and collaborating and helping with the private sector collaboration. And we really appreciate your time today, sir. Thank you, sir. Very, very interesting conversation. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks to the rest of you for joining in, for tuning in. We appreciate it. If you'd like to catch up on past episodes, they're at uschamberfoundation.org or on YouTube. We will see you for our next episode in July. In the meantime, get your vaccination and take care of yourselves and each other. We'll see you soon.